Okay. Um, my name is Sharon Black, and I'm here with uh, Struggle La Lucha um, and the Social Community Party, which is sponsoring today's class. Um, we're really privileged to have one of our acting editors and writers for Struggle La Lucha, which is a revolutionary socialist um, publication. And we are basically starting pretty much every other Sunday, but we'll send invitations out to everybody. Uh, Socialist Sundays, Revolutionary Socialist Sundays, so that during this pandemic, we will have a chance to strengthen ourselves politically and ideologically. So um, our first class is Marxist Economics for Organizers of the Coronavirus and the Capitalist Crisis. And as I said, we're um, very happy that um, one of the acting editors, Gary Wilson, can uh, lead us in this class. Just some basics. I think a lot of people are now very familiar with Zoom calls, um, but all of you are muted so that we don't hear background noise when Gary is actually speaking. Um, they'll actually be, this class will be in several sections. And when Gary finishes each section, the floor will be open for people to ask questions, make comments for about 10 to 15 minutes, but hopefully 10 minutes so that we can go on to the next section more discussion, next session, more discussion, et cetera, et cetera, so that you know this will be exciting and lively. We are recording, um, so if anybody doesn't want to be recorded, let me know when we do distribute our own video, we can edit that part out. But for right now, I'd like to turn the floor over to Gary um, and let him begin the actual um, class. Yeah, hi, I'm I'm Gary. Um, I have an introduction to the series, you know, the five sections that we have. Um, the um, coronavirus pandemic uh, is not the cause of the economic crisis that we see now. But it is the trigger that has set off a whole chain reaction. But before the coronavirus pandemic erupted, um, we, wa we saw that there was already uh, a crisis that was unfolding um, a year ago. Uh, in, in 2018, more than a year ago, there was a uh, global stock market downturn. I don't know if you remember that, but there was uh, the capitalist economy, it's uh, the economic growth, it stalled, uh, and then in last September, the US financial system ran out of cash and there was a bank run on Wall Street. Uh, the business press called it a repo crisis. It was a banking and credit crisis. And uh, after the bank run, the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank pumped in a trillion dollars into the repo market. But uh, really at that point, uh, many recession had already begun. The capitalist media look at uh, only the virus when they uh, talk about what's happening, but not at the they don't look at what is a general crisis of capitalism. The economic system is collapsing because it was already on the edge of a collapse. A healthy system would not respond in the same way. In socialist China, where most production was shut down and cities were put into quarantine, there were no layoffs, no one went hungry, there were no fields of vegetables plowed under 
or milk dumped or eggs tossed out. There wasn't a destructive economic crisis. In the US, where they now are predicting a recession. You, uh, the Jamie Dimon, who's the head of JP Morgan Chase, said that he expects a bad repression with high unemployment. The New York Times says that real unemployment uh, could go as high as 30%. Um, uh, one of the Wall Street hedge fund guys, Ray Dal Dalio, uh, he's a billionaire. He said, looking back to periods in history, when this configuration of circumstances occurred, he said, the last time was in the 1930s. So that's it's a capitalist crisis that we're facing. So we're going to take um, a look at the different aspects of the econ Marxist economy, uh, Marxist look at the economy. What um, and we'll, you know, see what um, for, you know, to get an understanding of uh, Marx's analysis of capitalism. Um, we'll start with Marx's theory of value and surplus value. This is part one. The theory of value is clear enough. Human beings can only live and satisfy their basic needs through labor. Marx says, every child knows that any nation that stopped working, not for a year, but let us say for just a few weeks would perish. You see that today. To contain the spread of the coronavirus, there's been a general shutdown of all businesses and everyone is to stay secluded at home. But there's an exception. And that is for so-called essential workers. That includes not just healthcare workers, but also anyone producing food, as well as transportation, electrical power, and other services. Labor is essential or we would perish. The labor of society is required to satisfy human needs. That's been true no matter how far back you go in history, from Paleolithic hunting and gathering to feudalism, capitalism, or socialism. Prior to the development of capitalism, labor produced objects directly for use. For example, no one would build a chair unless a chair was needed. When the capitalist market became dominant, producers started creating commodities for exchange. Now chairs are built and put up for sale. A chair still has a use value, but production is done for the market and exchange value. This is the basis of capitalist economic relations. Everyone becomes dependent on everyone else due to the social division of labor. That is because everyone needs the products produced by others. We call this the socialization of production the act of producing and distributing goods and services is changed from being solitary to a social relationship with collective work. But 
what Gary, I think we've lost you for two commodities that are all I'm sorry. Oh, I think we just lost you for two seconds. That's okay. You're oh, we're, we're going out. You're okay. You hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, but what commodities have in common is that they are all products of human labor. Oh, I said that. Marx says nature builds no machines, no locomotives, railways, electric telegraphs, self acting mules. This is 1800s. These are products of human industry. Machines, including computers and robots, are built by workers and they are the product of human labor. For the exchange of commodities, the generalized labor in one commodity can be compared with the generalized labor in another. In an exchange, a certain number of shirts can be traded for a certain number of cooking pots, depending on the quantity of labor time involved in their production. Commodities can therefore be considered to be condensed labor time. Uh, side note here, um, Marx does not say that labor is the only source of material wealth. Nature also contributes to the wealth of society. In Capital, Marx quotes an early English economist as correctly observing, that labor is the father of wealth and earth is its mother. While production and exchange are socialized relations between people, they appear to be relations among things. That is, what you see is money and commodities exchanged in the market. As we know, appearances can be deceptive. Each day the sun appears to go around the earth, when in reality it is that the earth travels around the sun. We have to untangle the appearance in order to reveal the reality that is hidden within. That is the reason for Marx's economic theory. Marx repeatedly explained that if truth could be obtained solely from the appearance of things, then there would be no need for science. We must see beyond the appearance of things to the real relationship. This is the aim of sci the science of Marxism. So you, should, you could say that the value of a commodity is hidden by the money exchange, by the price paid. The value can be measured according to the amount of time that was invested in its production. In the process of production, machines do not create new value. Only workers' labor can create new value. Machines simply transfer their own value based on the labor required to produce them, transfer their value bit by bit to the new commodities through depreciation. Machines have to be put to use by workers, and they are the primary way that productivity is increased. Under capitalism, labor is a commodity, and the workers sell their labor power. You sell your labor power, and when you go to work, your labor produces new value. For this, you are paid a wage, that should at least cover all of your basic needs, but never is it as much as the new value you've produced. The difference between what you've been paid and the full value of what you've produced is called surplus value. Value and surplus value come from the labor of the working class. Profit is simply the unpaid labor of the working class. Marx notes that the surplus value is actually divided up part is profit to the capitalists. The rest is rent to landlords, interest payments, 
to the banks and taxes for government services. So that's value and surplus value. Did you want to ask a question, Gary? Yes. Um, so we should, we can, we'll, this is the first section and maybe we can uh, open it up for discussion, comments, questions. Um, Did you want to throw a question out there, Gary, or we'll just, um, we don't have to if you don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I don't have a question. Okay, no problem. Um, if anybody would like to get on stack, um, please, please um, uh, raise your hand um, and state your name if you'd like to be on stack. The other thing, too, is there is a little thing down there that says chat. So if you're shy about actually speaking out on the call, you can also use the little chat thing to ask a question or to make a comment. So um, I'm going to open up the gallery view and see if there's anybody who has something to add to this discussion, a question to ask. Um, so give everybody a few seconds and unmute your phone if you'd like to be on stack so I can take your name. If you wanted to speak or say something and your phone is muted, there's a little icon that's a speaker icon that you should unmute. I'll give everybody about two more seconds. Um, Go ahead, John. Are you uh, John Parker in LA. Okay. Um, thanks, Gary, for that. Um, you know, there's a lot of differences in when people say, um, it's just funny when people say your, your money is, um, it's my money, I made my money, blah, da, 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 da. And like you said, that thing you said about it's no, um, it, the, the, the labor time that took to create that money, the money is just a reflection, like you're saying, the money is a reflection of, of um, the amount of labor time to create the value that, that money is worth but people don't see it. They, that, that social relation is hidden. So folks say things like, like Bezos, oh, I made my money, I did this, but if that money is really a, a, a reflection of um, uh, labor created by society, by workers, um, uh, that shows that, but it also, there's also a difference in does that reflect, um, so I give my labor time and I, I create surplus value, <laughs> I create this value that's reflected in that money. Um, does that mean I'm exploited? Or is my exploitation coming from my inability to say where that, how that money is gonna get used or that surplus value is gonna get used? That's my question. Gary? Gary, um, you want to answer that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, the, um, the exploitation is the, the, uh, the exploitation is the fact that you're, um, you, that your labor Part of your labor is unpaid. That your uh, that what you've you know what you what's taken it, you you know 
you have this relationship with the capitalists you work, they pay you for part of your labor time. Part of your, you know, for your labor power, they hire you for eight hours, they pay you for two hours of it, you know, or your pay covers is covered by the first two hours of your work and then the rest of it goes to the capitalists. Um, that's, that's where the exploitation is. Anybody else on stack? Another question or comment? Um, this is Alec. I would like to ask Gary a question. Go ahead, Alec. Hold on, Alec. Let me ask if there's any other questions. Sure. First. No problem. Um, anybody else? Okay, Alec, go ahead. Um, Gary, I was just wondering if you'd be want to talk a little bit about how um, Often there's a misconception that supply and demand strictly um, drives uh, productive forces um, and, and sort of related to that, the idea of cost. So I was just wondering if you'd want to talk a little bit about that sort of misconception and how um, the uh, value created by labor is, is much more of a driving force and what Mark says about that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, you might want to explain it, uh, you know, or, you know, that, uh, that'd be good. Um, I mean, supply and demand is uh, a factor in the marketplace, um, but it's not... Uh, it's not what produces value. Uh, the uh, the the value ultimately in the and what what then gets shown in the price is uh, the labor involved. So. Um, there, things can be uh, well. For example, th um, one uh, example that's used is uh, diamonds. So diamonds, uh, it the price, you know, might appear to be. Uh, supply and demand based on supply and demand, but actually, it's the amount of labor. Um, the, there's a tremendous amount of labor required in order to produce a diamond from the mining to the, you know, the rest of the work that's required in order to get it to. Um, to be this gem that is very costly. Um, the, uh, but it, that is hidden. Um, the same is true with gold. Gold, and it's part of the reason that gold, uh, gold was money. It's, um, it, you know, it can, it was money partly because it could be, um, it could be, you know, easily co put into coins and so on. It became uh, convenient to use, but it's also the, the amount of labor involved in mining and production of gold is tremendous. And so it, that's what makes it 
very valuable. Um, I don't know, but you might, uh, you know, have more, you could say, you, you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, I think everybody here can, you know, it knows, knows some of this or knows, you know, uh, and has their own experience with it and uh, can explain uh, different aspects of it, of what we're talking about uh, from your own, uh, you know, your own knowledge, your own experience. I would like to hear uh, Alec uh, his his perspective. Not to put you on the spot, but well, I don't know. Um, Stephen on stack. Uh, Stephen, you want to go ahead and get on stack? I don't. I can. Carl, well, Alec will chime in a little later. Go ahead, Stephen, and then we'll open up the stack again. The final. Um, Folks don't mind whatever I like to give a stab, um, particularly because you hear in economics, supply and demand drives price and is really the locomotive engine for um, capitalism. But like Gary was saying, um, supply and demand only affects the fluctuation of price, but price is really based on the value of something and that's only based on the amount of labor that goes into it like he was explaining glass has a value and it um there's blind demand of of glass but glass will never cost as much as a diamond and that's because the amount of labor to produce glass is so much uh cheaper than it is for a diamond and so regardless if the demand it's 20 fold, it still will never be the same amount as, as a diamond. Or take copper, for example, and gold. Copper will never be the same price, even if there may be a bigger demand for copper than gold, because the amount of labor that goes into copper and the amount of labor that goes into gold uh, will always be, is always more labor intensive for gold and it's because there's more copper in the world. So it's easier to mine um, and things of that nature. And you could break that down to every commodity and they don't want to um, ever discuss the labor value when it comes to price, because if they would do that, then workers wouldn't understand that it's really their labor that really determines all value in society. And so they give this false notion that it's, um, demand, um, supply and demand, which determines price. It may determine a little bit of the fluctuation, but it doesn't determine the value of that price. I'm still muted. Um, actually, I wanted to ask a question, but before I ask a question, I we have about a few minutes before we go on to the next se section. And I see um, okay, I see a bunch of comments, but none of them were questions. Um, but at any rate, I wanted to ask a question, but before I ask the question, because um, we like to try to do progressive stack, is there any of the, I mean, put this for the women, is there any of the women on this call who want to um, ask a question or make a comment before I ask a question? Anybody? Okay, then I'll ask a question. Um, and it's to anybody really, because um, the two articles that um, that we sent out to read, um, you know, along with some of the Marxist material that probably may seem a little bit more complex, oh, yeah, you know, raised, um, let me mute some people. Everybody mute um, if you're not actually speaking. Um, I wanted to raise a question because I think it comes up in, in the popular, um, news and people's minds and stuff. And that is the question of the stock market. 
um, and how Marxists view the stock market versus the actual real material, material crisis in terms of capitalism slowing down. And I thought there was a very good illustration on um, the gas and oil glut. And if anybody would want to make a comment on that, um, you know, that's sort of my question to throw out to the group is that discussion, because a lot of times people see the stock market crashing and they think that's the actual collapse. But if somebody would want to try to explain that, that would be really good. And if not, and, and I think Gary was alluding to this, but this is a group class, so it doesn't have to be every question is towards Gary. Um, we'll wear him out. He's got four more sections of this, this um, class. So if anybody wants to comment on the stock market and the uh, oil and gas uh, overproduction. And you can raise your hand. There's an icon to raise your hand, but I don't see it on this particular thing. So maybe others see it. Um, but you can unmute and answer that question. Somebody's trying to unmute him and say something, but I can't. I got a comment, but it's not an answer to that question. That's okay. Go ahead and comment, John. And then I think. This way. Uh, Go ahead, John. And by the way, uh, Bill Doris just said it's at the top of your, the icon's at the top. If you- John want. said he's frozen. Hold on, let me see if he can. You wanna come here? It's still open. Oh, well, for some reason, my computer froze. It's we can hear you, John. For some reason, my, my froze. Just what Stephen was saying about the um, uh, supply and demand and things, it just made me think of a good example for folks because the, the real life situation is important to understand some of these things. And I, I say it a lot of times about what happened in 2006 in Los Angeles when a million people went out in the streets um, in, a, uh, in a general strike against this anti-immigrant um, labor law, the uh, Simpson-Brenner bill. And um, they went out and for one day, they, they didn't work. And downtown was empty. It was, you know, all the businesses were closed and things. And um, after one day, corporations losing billions of dollars, that bill was off the table. It didn't take legislators. It didn't take a bunch of, um, of folks and trying to vote somebody in or all that. It, was just, it just took workers stopping their uh, labor. Uh, and so it just shows what the value, that value that they created, that these corporations couldn't make a dime, or couldn't make that surplus value, they couldn't make their profits without the workers. So it's an important point about this, most important point about where the value comes from. Because like Stephen said, it's, they tell us that you, are, you have no worth as a worker. You're, you should be lucky you go to work and get your paycheck and things like that. You should be, you should thank, you should kiss uh, Bezos's feet and all that crap when they can't exist without us. So it's, it's an important thing. People talk about self-help and going and self-worth things and guru stuff and everything. But, well, this is a good way to, to realize your worth is to realize that you're the one that creates the value that the society lives on, which means we have the power. So that's it, I'm sorry. No, thank you, John. Um, doesn't matter, my question can get answered later. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next segment so that Gary can introduce the second segment. Go ahead. Okay, the second segment um, yeah, is expand or die. Um, so several years ago, there was a, an eco-socialist manifesto that declared that capitalism is a primary source of environmental destruction because of capitalism's imperative to constantly expand production and that capitalism is predicated upon the rule 
grow or die. The point was that capitalism is not only a source of environmental destruction, but that capitalism itself, itself is an obstacle to ending environmental destruction. So the only way to stop the destruction is to get rid of capitalism and replace it with socialism, with a planned economy. So all that's certainly true. I wouldn't argue against any of it. Um, and many have endorsed this, this, this idea, the ideas put forth in this manifesto and uh, the necessity for socialism. Uh, many current statements coming from uh, about climate change make reference to capitalism's rule of grow or die. You'll see it if you look for it. Um, but what they don't explain is why capitalism must expand or die why the capitalists expand or die. So how do we explain it? Well, capitalist competition is one reason. Capitalist competition drives the capitalists to constantly expand production, often with new machinery or computers or robots to increase the productivity of labor lower their costs and maximize profit, or they'll die to a rival capitalist. A second reason is that capitalists are in business to make a profit. The production of goods and services is done primarily to generate money profit, which must be reinvested, or the new capital would figuratively die. Constant investment to expand production is required to maintain profits. In capital, in, in, you know, in the book Capital, Marx calls this expanded reproduction. Finally, uh, in the words of the Communist Manifesto, I'll quote here, the need of a constantly expanding market for its products pushes the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. That is, markets must be constantly expanding or production will come to a halt. That's expand or die. So we can continue our discussion here. And, uh, you know, I welcome questions, but I've, you know, it's, I'm not, I mean, I think, you know, better it'd be for, uh, for, or to discuss the the points or the issues, and you know, clarify it, expand on it. Well, Liz, for stack. Go ahead, Liz. Yes, thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't know if this is the the place to put it or if the next sections are going to talk about, you know, what we mean by a planned economy. Um, but uh, how does the uh, government in China explain, I mean, if they know that, you know, if you, if you include some capitalist sectors into your economy, they're going to be always competing. They're going to be being pushed by profit. They're going to be, you know, all these things that we talk about that drive capitalism. How can they, um, I don't know, um, convince 
the people that opening up some sectors of their economy to capitalism is not going to de destroy their planned economy. I just always had this question, so it's out there for whoever wants to answer it or thinks they can answer it. Good question. So we have that on the table along with expand and die. So, and Gary's very modest, so he's going to, he's going to say this and he means it. Anybody on this call who wants to take a stab at any of this discussion should feel encouraged to do so. And there's no wrong or right. We're learning together collectively. So anyhow, Liz had a question out there. And even if it's a little different than what was on the table, we should get into the discussion. It's a very important one. So uh, who wants to be on the stack next? On either issue. Um, this is Alec. I can, I, I can take a stab at Liz's question, but I, I like to be on a progressive stack. So if anybody else wants to talk first, they should. I, I can be on stack. This is Gloria. Go ahead, Gloria. You want to go ahead? Um, yeah. So he said expand and die. So right now, are we at the, the point of death? I mean, because, you know, um, it's, it's expanded to the point that at this point, it's like, um, you know, with automation and with, um, uh, you know, um, right now people are losing their jobs and, uh, you know, 16 million people are, you know, applying for unemployment and there's no guarantee that those jobs are going to come back. Some of those jobs that we were talking about, I guess on one call we were talking about people where they have truck, trucks that are you know, automated, you know, truck driving, uh, you know, uh, out, you know, and groceries and stuff. Now you just go and pick up your stuff from, you know, cabinets. And it's like, we're in the stage now where, you know, uh, technology is expanding, but it's not leaving any, any room for, you know, the workers. So it seems like expansion for profits, you know, as there's the gap between the, the, um, the poor and the rich is getting wider and wider and wider. So is that where we're, we're getting to the point where capitalism is dying? You know, it's, it's like expanding death. Right now we're in, at a point where it's dying, but it's like the transitional part is the part, you know, that I'm kind of, you know, I don't know how that part is going to happen to make that transition from the death of capitalism to the rise of a planned economy to socialism and i think that people are scared and scared saying that the death of capitalism how are we gonna you know maintain the money flow? how are we gonna do this how are we gonna make this exchange so it seems like right now we're getting to the point where capitalism has expanded you know over its realm where it's either going to be the super rich and the super poor and that just doesn't work so i think we're at the point of we're approaching the point of the death of capitalism you finished, Gloria? Okay, yes. then, then a next person I'd like to call on is um, Andrew Herm and then Alec, because Andrew, you haven't spoken yet, Andrew Herm. And Andrew, where are you from? Because I think you're the furthest away from all of them. Yeah, so I hope you all can, one, see me, because it's dark here, it's almost. We can see you. Yeah, it's almost midnight. So I'm, I'm here in Hamburg, Germany, uh, and I'm cool. here. Oh. Ah standing in uh, sort of for the other comrades who can't be here in part because it's late and in part because I don't know if their English is good enough for the conversation. Um, but I'm originally from Philly, so I can, I think I can do this. I can understand almost everybody. Um, ah, yeah, sorry. What I wanted to say was, I mean, just a, just a stab at, uh, I think it was Liz, Liz's question regarding sort of the, the functionality or the ability of a planned economy in China to work. I mean, obviously it's a huge conversation and it is complicated, but one of the things I, I think that is or has functioned in parts as a, as a saving grace is that at the very least, um, you know, vast majority of the major private companies in China uh, have at least one member 
of the Communist Party of China sitting on their board of directors. And that member on the board of directors for those companies has veto power over any decisions that are made by those private companies. Um, so that is just one of the, the means through which uh, you know, the CPC has been able to at the very least attempt to sort of cage some of that rampant, uh, well, anarchy, you know, th this latent in, in capitalism when you in inject that into, into any kind of uh, economy. You know, it is a threat for a planned, planned economy. Look at Yugoslavia, right? Um, I think the other thing too, though, is, is just, just regarding that in <clears throat> that whole situation, right? I mean, China, even though they have introduced capitalist reforms, what they, they've raised roughly 800 million people out of poverty. But there is, to a certain degree, some kind of method to the madness, right? It is working in certain ways to, to some degree. Um, but I know for certain that's not a full answer to the question, uh, but that's just a stab at it. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. I have, to, I wanna read one uh, comment from Ina Martinez to everyone. The U.S. is the country that is imposing capitalism on the rest of the world. What can we do from here, the USA? Um, that was one question. We have Alec on stack, and I'm trying to see who else is on stack. Anyway. Uh, no good. Sharon, I'll pass. I'm taking myself off stack. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be on stack as is Andrew. Okay. And anybody else on stack before I call on Andrew? Yeah, it's just uh, and Scott. Um, I'm going to call on Scott. And yeah, Mary Lou. Okay, so I'm going to call on Scott, Andrew, and Mary Lou in that order. Um, I just wanted to share a conversation that I had with someone a long time ago that's related to the question of capitalism's feature of expand or die. Um, one time I asked somebody who's, um, you know, was uh, kind of a Marxist scholar. Uh, I was just sort of thinking about the whole question of, uh, my question to him was, why aren't there capitalists, big capitalists, who would just step forward and pay a better wage enough so that uh, people's living standards could be high enough so that they could avoid rebellion? It would still be capitalism, but more controlled, and et cetera, et cetera. And his response to me was, okay, who's going to go first? And that told me that what he was really saying was that capitalists are incapable of doing anything that uh, makes them vulnerable from the point of view of making less profit. And that is because um, one of the tenets of Marxism uh, is, that, is that capitalism flows to the highest rate of profit. But what does that mean in real terms? It means that a big company, let's say an auto manufacturer, raises the wages of all their workers. So their profit turns out to be less in the next quarter than all the other auto manufacturers. Then what happens is their investors back out. They take their money and put it to companies that are making higher profits. So, I, I, I mean, that's just, one example, but I think it permeates the whole capitalist system that you you have to be profitable to get capital. You have to be profitable to survive. And you can't do that by, in other words, your, your arrival with the profit line of other, other manufacturers. Andrew, and then Mary Lou. Go ahead, Andrew. Hi, it's Andrew. Um, I thought I would just try to illustrate the expand or die idea uh, by using the Philippines as, um, as an example. Um, you know, the, the United States began colonizing um, the Philippines and Cuba and Puerto Rico at around the same time, at the exact same time, actually. Um, and this is, you know, shortly after the Industrial Revolution, um, shortly as the United States had finished expanding all the way across North America. Um, and, and the reason that they wanted to do this, uh, and by this I mean 
you know, colonizing Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines is because it needed to expand or it was going to die. Um, and basically what that means is uh, by expanding to these colonies, they were able to expand to new markets, first of all. Um, as, as soon as uh, full development of capitalist, the, the capitalist mode of production um, takes place, you begin to set, saturate your own markets. Um, and when you saturate your markets, the demand for products and commodities goes down and so does the prices and so, so do the profits. Um, so what you need to do is find a new market. The idea um, around invading the Philippines is gaining access not only to um, a dumping ground for new consumer goods because they're always constantly overproduced, um, is you get the new market to sell to sell those uh, overproduced um, surplus commodities to, but also the potential for new workers who will work for less. It's, it's a constant race to the bottom as far as trying to pay workers less. Um, and in the United States where, you know, slave labor had at that point been fully eradicated, they needed to find a way to pay less for workers and um, keep profits increasing. Um, and so that's why we have these neo-colonies like the Philippines, like South Korea, like Puerto Rico. Um, it's, these are dumping grounds for commodity goods, um, sources of cheaper labor, um, and a way to keep profits up. So I thought that might be helpful as an illustrative example. Mary Lou, and then we're gonna go on to the third section. Mary Lou. Yeah, uh, just real briefly, uh, I'm neither an economist nor a rocket scientist or a genius, but the way it was explained, has been explained that helped me understand is we live in a finite world. There's a finite amount of drinkable water in the world we live in. There's a finite amount of oil, even though they keep trying to increase <laughs> that, but nonetheless, there's a finite amount of oil. It's a finite world. It has limits. It has, and capitalism, as I understand it, is based on the theory of ever-expanding profits in ever-expanding markets. Well, logic, which I'm not great at either, but logic seems to say that you cannot have an ever-expanding profit or an ever-expanding market in a finite world. So logic should say that capitalism has a fatal flaw in its, in its beginning uh, philosophy. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say, uh, there was, um, and I've heard of this, and I can't remember who it was or what the company's name, but there was some CEO or who was making, I don't know, maybe a million dollars or more or whatever. Anyhow, he cut his own salary down to about $70,000 in order to increase the wages he was paying to his workers to around $70,000. And it has not been followed by... <laughs> Uh, big corporations or anything like that, and never will be, that he was a very popular boss and CEO. He had some really loyal uh, workers because he did that. So uh, I'm just saying the inherent uh, lack of um, intelligent support for a system like capitalism is inherent in its first philosophy and inherent in the fact that even when somebody did that, remained, his company remained profitable, his workers were happy, he was able to live on his greatly reduced salary because the reality is nobody needs five houses 
10 cars, three jet airplanes, nobody. You can only use one thing at a time, whether it's a house or a car or a plane. So capitalism leads to these drastic excesses for the people at the top and the drastic poverty for the 99 and 9 tenths percent of the rest of us where we're struggling from paycheck to paycheck. That's, That's just my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. And we're going to go on to the next part. We haven't answered all the questions. Okay. This is ongoing discussion. So Gary, I am going to... Um, yeah, and I, you know, uh, I, I just, I'll, I want to add that, um, you know, the expand or die, the, and we'll get into this, um, it, you know, the, the, the crises of capitalism, the, you know, the recession, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it is, it's horrible. What, what happens is, um, it's horrible. Um, unfortunately, the expand or die is it, um, it, the, it happens to the individual capitalist enterprises, uh, and so on, but it doesn't, the, the system itself doesn't die. Um, and our, the only way, um, the only way you can end the, the that misery, the, the crises and uh, unemployment and and so on is to, you know, get rid of the capitalist system. You know, the, it has to be, it has to be thrown out. It has to be overthrown. Um, it, there isn't a, it's not gonna just collapse completely and disappear. Um, anyway. Um, no matter how much you wish it would. Um, so capitalist, the third part here is capitalist crises. Capitalist crises are crises of overproduction. It's a simple fact of life that capitalism has had economic crises on a periodic basis since at least 1825. Every 10 years or so, capitalism goes through a cycle of boom and bust. Most, if not all, capitalist crises since 1825 have tended to begin in the consumer goods sector, especially residential construction, housing, other durable goods, Industries such as the auto industry, which became important during the last century, also tend to turn down before the rest of the economy does. The current crisis is no exception. The U.S. housing crisis is a construction crisis, is a crisis of overproduction. There's more than 53,000 homeless people in Los Angeles, yet there are more than 100,000 vacant apartments and houses there. The housing is needed, but it remains vacant because it can't be sold for a profit. The auto industry is similarly in a grip of an overproduction crisis. A CNBC report no, last November said global car sales expected to slide by 3.1 million this year and the steepest drop since the Great Recession. Automakers are slashing the workforce at the fastest pace since the Great Recession of 2008, a decade ago. The crisis of global overproduction in the car industry sharpened by the race to dominate the transition to electric and hybrid vehicles, triggered the latest gigantic merger that happened, B 
between the French based Peugeot and Fiat Chrysler. The aircraft industry was in a crisis of oversupplies, the business press puts it, which was relieved somewhat when the Boeing 737 MAX was grounded. The financial press is now warning that the return of the 737 MAX would trigger a crisis. There could potentially be as many as 1,000 surplus aircraft next year. Oil has been hit by a crisis of overproduction and the oil industry is on the verge of collapsing. The overproduction crisis has plagued big oil since at least 2018. Oil prices have been falling steadily. Today it is near $20 a barrel, while a year ago it was $78 a barrel. Except for times of war, the capitalist boom and bust cycle is the result of a general crisis of overproduction. Overproduction is a result of the anarchy of capitalist production. That's anarchy, not chaos. The individual owners of the means of production produce goods and services with no guarantee of a buyer. The inevitable result is a mass of commodities with no buyers for many reasons, including a competitor's product being cheaper or better, or the product is no longer needed. Under capitalism, it is not possible to prevent or avoid crises of overproduction because they result from an irresolvable contradiction of the system, the anarchy of production. In socialism, scientific and utopian, Frederick Engels describes capitalist crises as collisions between two forces, production and markets. Capitalists expand production seemingly without limit and are in competition among themselves to do that, but the markets expand only slowly, if at all. Since under capitalism, production cannot grow faster than the market, this contradiction is periodically resolved through a massive contraction of production, destruction of existing productive forces and mass unemployment. Just one uh, note on um, if the overproduction is overproduction of commodities and it means that there, um, whatever the commodity is, it cannot be sold at a profit. Um, and that's the important part of it. It has to be, um, you know, make a profit. Um, and, you know, if, if today you were to, you know, if you were to, tomorrow, you were to wake up and everything was a socialist economy, you'd find that there wasn't, uh, overproduction because the you know many of the commodities that are have been overproduced they have a use and they would be used because you know they could be sold because they don't have to have a profit um, so it's a, it's a overproduction is not overproduction of what's needed. It's, uh, it involves not being able to sell it for a profit. 
that's we can now that's the end of that section we can open up the discussion again gary yes i'll ask you a question um, yes. i'm looking at the time mm -hmm. and i'm judging by what we have on here in our outline whether you want to continue on to imperialism we're like about a half an hour before we're scheduled to end i took into consideration we started a little later um we can go to later we could go to seven if people would like to do so but we also have to go over imperialism in the working class. Mm -hmm. Would you rather go on to imperialism um, or and okay. the working class, and then we can just open up the floor to discussion, and then you can sum up. Would that be okay? Sure. So we're not. So we'll just go right into the next two sections. Okay. So I'll, I'll just continue. Gotcha. Uh, this section's imperialism. So imperialism is you probably know, is not a policy that can be chosen by a group of corporations or by a government. Imperialism is a system. Lenin wrote on imperialism as a specific historical stage of capitalism, monopoly capitalism. Lenin wrote that, um, this is a quote, the 20th century marks the turning point from the old capitalism to the new, from the domination of capital in general to the domination of finance capital. The concentration of production, the monopolies arising therefrom, the merging or coalescence of the banks with industry, such is the history of the rise of finance capital. The domination of finance capital has meant that the financiers get the greater portion of the wealth created by the rest of the economy. As Marx explained, surplus value comes from production, but it is then redistributed to the other sectors of the economy. The division is characterized by rent, interest, and profit, the holy trinity of capitalism, where the surplus value extracted from the labor of the working class is divided between the industrialist profit, the banker's interest, and the landlord's rent. While banks and other financial interest, in, financial institutions do have a necessary function under capitalism to, in providing loans, they are parasitic in the way that other capital is not. The share now going to the financial sector has reached colossal proportions. Lenin's imperialism was written in 1916 in the middle of the First World War. The partition of the world by the international monopolies was already in place and war was an, and the war was an inter-imperialist war to redivide the world. It was Germany, Austria, Hungary and Turkey that were called the central powers versus Britain, France, Russia, the allied powers. The US later joined the allied powers. Germany had only a handful of colonies while Britain and France dominated most of the world. Lenin wrote the export of capital is distinct from the export of commodities under non-monopoly capitalism is a highly characteristic phenomenon and is closely linked with the economic and territorial political partition of the world. There were at the time over a hundred international cartels that dominated the world market and divided it among themselves that war was capitalist competition to redivide the world market. This expansion into foreign countries was a new stage in the expansion of business, the export of capital. Business had been exporting ordinary commodities of trade for centuries. The export of capital was something new. And it couldn't be done without foreign wars, imperialist wars. 
the export of capital means not just controlling territory, it means the steady shift of large-scale industrial production from the imperialist countries to the low-wage colonial and semi-colonial countries in order to escape the higher wages that they were obliged to pay in large part due to the struggles of the workers' movement in the imperialist countries. The reason is that capitalism is not interested in expanding material production for its own sake. The capitalists are only interested in expanding product, the production of surplus value. and surplus value can only be produced by workers. Capitalism has moved industrial production to countries where work in large scale basic industry is very much low wage work. The trend of capitalism is to convert as much work as possible into low wage jobs. The imperialist wars since the Second World War have been wars against national independence movements, blocking the development of rival industries and markets, as well as against liberation movements and socialist revolutions, the ultimate rival uh, to finance capital. Another side of the endless imperialist wars over the last few decades is what is called contracted reproduction as opposed to expanded reproduction. Under capitalism, contracted reproduction occurs during crises of overproduction. Since under capitalism, production cannot in the long run grow faster than the market, the contradiction is periodically resolved through massive contraction of production, destruction of existing production, productive forces, and massive unemployment. Imperialist wars carry out the destruction of capital, a necessary part of resolving a, capital, a crisis of overproduction, thereby creating a profitable new economic development. A function of the military industrial complex is to act as a sector of capitalism, producing the means of destruction. The final part here is on the working class. Capitalist production is not merely the production of commodities, it is essentially the production of surplus value. That's actually, that sentence there is right out of uh, Capital by Marx in the first volume. You work not just to work, you must produce surplus value. The key to capitalist production is that the worker produces surplus value. Right, Marx writes about productive labor and unproductive labor. The difference between productive and unproductive labor is a key part of Marx's economic analysis. By productive labor, Marx means labor that produces surplus value, whether or not it produces material products. Common examples of productive labor are factory assembly line workers or mine workers, non-productive labor, examples of non-productive labor, labor that does not produce surplus value. Examples are cops or soldiers. Non-productive doesn't mean that they just sit around all day. It means that they don't produce surplus value. Some point to the expansion of non-productive labor as a drag on the capitalist economy. And there's been a lot of expansion of non-productive labor in this country. On productive labor, generally no one person produces 
a completed product under capitalism. There is a division of labor which enormously increases the productivity of labor. So when you look at almost any product at the store, there have usually been dozens if not hundreds of workers required for its production. Think of the iPhone. It's made of plastics, metal, glass. The raw materials have to be mined and converted to solid materials and cast into the various components. Then the thousands of separate pieces have to be assembled. The, the Foxconn operation in China where this is done has two factories that together employ 420,000 workers, the biggest factories in the world. After the iPhone is assembled, it is programmed with software that was developed in massive coding factory operations that are in Silicon Valley and in India and other areas around the world. The complete <coughs> product is then boxed and shipped to stores or directly to buyers. That is all, for the most part, productive labor. It is the product of the collective labor of hundreds of thousands of workers. This is socialized production. When we talk about productive labor, people are often confused about service workers. Bourgeois economists use service sector as a catch-all term to mystify the nature of service workers and to see them as other than industrial workers. The most diverse groups of people are lumped into the category of service workers, ranging from highly paid white collar managerial personnel in suits to low paid workers wearing company mandated uniforms. Most of these service workers, most of the service workers, the fast food, hotel and retail workers, are actually commodity producing industrial workers. If by industrial workers, we mean workers who produce surplus value. Indeed, the work done by workers in McDonald's, KFC, Chipotle, Burger King, Pizza Hut, and so on, are engaged in industrial production, even if the workplaces are called restaurants as opposed to factories. In a fast food restaurant, in contrast to the classic factory, the final customer comes directly to the place of work to purchase and consume or take out the product. And production in a fast food restaurant is on a much smaller scale than production of a steel plant or the assembly of automobiles or smartphones. This is also true of other service industries, such as hotels and car washes. If you're employed by a hotel, you're engaged in social labor whose product is exchanged for a sum of money on the market. It is therefore social value producing labor. This type of labor becomes under the capitalist mode of production, it becomes a value. As in the case with fast food, a hotel is an enterprise that provides a product that is almost immediately consumed by the consumer where, where the work is performed, the hotel room. Karl Marx's analysis of value, surplus value, wages and profits is by no means limited to what is called factory work. Are the workers who work for Walmart industrial workers? Amazon warehouse workers, are they? Walmart is the biggest employer in the country with over 2 million workers. Retail stores include many kinds of value creating labor. Examples are warehousing and stocking of store shelves, where, which place the commodities where the consumers of commodities can inspect and purchase them, truck drivers moving goods around town or across country or delivering directly to the consumer. 
this labor adds to the use value of commodities and is therefore value creating labor in the sense that Marx used the term. So is the labor that includes, so is the labor that includes the work of cleaning and maintaining a store. And since the work done by Walmart and Amazon workers is done by wage workers, that work is very much surplus value producing productive labor. When the current crisis started, 42% of the US labor force was making less than $15 an hour. The capitalist system has organized work, life and society only to maximize profits. Low wage workers of the world unite. That's the end. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good good way to end your comments. Um, we're gonna open up for discussion for about 15 minutes. And then basically from there, we'll um, let Gary say a few last words. Um, so I'm gonna open up the floor. Is there anybody? that would like to be on stack. I see, I see yeah. two hands already. Uh, I see Maggie, I is that for John? And I see yeah, Liz. I, oh yeah, I, I spoke already, so whatever. Okay, Maggie. No, I'm not raising my hand, I'm just clapping. Oh, okay, sorry, okay. So any other, anybody else who'd like to be on stack? John, um, Maggie, did you have your hand up? Okay. Okay, good. Anybody else? I'm going on the other screen because we have a full screen. Okay. So, John, why don't you go ahead? Oh, just quick. Oh, I want to want to thank Gary. It's, it's so great for delving into capital. It's it's not an easy read, <laughs> but um, um, the way you really put in in, in stuff, how, how you can really easily see who we are as workers through all your last comments and everything too. It's so important to empower us. Um, and then I just wanted to encourage everybody to look at Gary's articles, especially on this COVID-19. It's really mind blowing this, the missteps and, and relating it to the, to, the, to, the, to the theory we've been talking about and, then, um, and, and, and how oil production and climate change, really great uh, contributions. So thanks, Gary. I just wanted to say, um, um, you know, when we were talking about China, the people were asking about the China thing. It was a real quick thing. In 2015, the Fortune Globe, Fortune Magazine had a list of the top 500 um, top com uh, companies, capitalist countries. 98 of them were Chinese, and only 22 of those 98 are are um, private. So the majority, great majority, are are state-run enterprises. That means the largest utility in the world, which is oil, it resides in China, that's state owned. The, the financial, auto, transportation, railway, all that stuff is, is state owned uh, enterprises in China. And that's the other thing. The other thing was um, um, about the, um, we we're talking about the surplus value and stuff. And it's just, I, cause you know, they, in socialist production, they produce surplus value as well. But just to see the difference is that the surplus value is, it's, it's, it's in a, produced by workers that they're able to decide how that society, decide how that surplus value is gonna be used. Um, and how, you know, Gary was saying it goes to the, here in capitalist country goes to the landlords, it goes to da, 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 everybody, the worker has no decision at all. But under socialist production, they, they get to, that's how the Soviet Union was able to defeat the Nazis because society decided that this was a priority so that they're going to use their industry to create the weapons necessary to do that. So just that. And then what Inya was talking about, about the, um, what can we do to end capitalism and things? I think one of the most important things we can do right now is to expose not only Trump, but this entire system and um, that, that the whole system is the problem. And it's, uh, and anybody, I don't care if it's Biden or whoever that says that uh, it tries to make workers ignorant of that fact that this system has to be changed. Um, that's a big, that's the problem. So we have to really expose, continue to expose this system that's untenable for workers. That's it, thanks. Thank you, John. Anybody else on stack? Then I'm gonna call myself actually. Um, a couple things, I thought that, um, 
the end point that uh, Gary discussed, which was in, in regard to workers and who are the workers, um, is I think right now very important in this particular period because when you talk about essential workers, when they keep talking about those, you know, whether it's grocery workers or whether it's those workers who are in the supply chain, like the Amazon workers or people who are delivering things, um, I thought it was very important that Gary explained how they add value to things because there's sometimes this very short-sighted explanation of who is who are workers and of course when we talk about the working class we're talking about everybody that's involved family you know people that are unemployed um, all the workers as a whole but it's important to talk about it because these are the workers who are on the front lines. And of course, we think of the nurses and the others who we see that have been promoted, but there's a lot of folks that aren't recognized. So in this crisis, it's good to think about that concept and how important, important it is. I mean, like longshore workers who unload the ships and stuff. Uh, so I wanted to add that um, I'm glad that um, uh, John said something in regard to um, Inez's question, because I think that's really ultimately what I'll get into, because our next, our next discussion group, which will be more of a webinar, is going to be on uh, Lenin, the thinker and fighter, which really gets into you know, what Lenin contributed to our struggle um, and how we can change it. I did want to go back on the screen and read some of what folks have written that's important. Um, and some of the questions haven't been fully answered, and we expected that in two hours, it's hard to answer everything. Um, Andrew Herm had written, um, you know, in, in regard to the question on China, no worries, complicated topic, but even the USSR had to inject capital into the market in the form of the N NEP to kickstart their command economy. China's NEP had has just lasted longer and has, has had colonialism and imperialism to contend with. And I think that's an important concept in terms of colonialism and imperialism. I mean, all of the uh, countries building socialism have had to contend with the capitalist market, which is still the dominant mode of production in the world. And so it goes back to Ina's, Ina's question, Ina Martinez, and that is that we got to get rid of social, I mean, got, get, or get rid of co capitalism and build socialism. And in this country, it'll be extremely important because whatever we do here will reverberate internationally and help every country trying to break free from the shackles of capitalism and imperialism. Um, but I think the conversation is extremely important and we'll never be able to answer every question. Um, but I did want, uh, Gary to have the last word. Um, and we promised people we would go on for two hours. Um, and then we would, you know, not make let people have a rest. I did want to write one thing in the Zoom chat for people. I want to leave our email address for Struggle La Lucha. Um, of course, people will get notice of the next time, which is Sunday. Um, I guess I'm getting feedback. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to say something too, Sharon. This is Liz for Stack. Go ahead. Go ahead, Liz. Um, before we give it to Gary. Um, yeah, I was I was having this discussion with someone. It's, it relates to, um, you know, people like myself and other people that are in semi-professional positions, including the healthcare workers and, um, you know, mental health workers and people like that, that we are considered part of the service economy and that because we don't work in a factory, we're not considered to be producers of surplus, um, uh, you know, um, but in, in the money that we make in no way compares to the money that the insurance companies, Big Pharma and, and many other uh, companies make from the labor that we provide. So I just wanted to say that. And if anybody else can elaborate too on that topic, including Gary, thanks. And Gloria Verdue has also said, educators are essential online classes, maybe social 
social value workers. Uh, Gary, you want to? Oh, Maggie. Maggie, I'm sorry, Maggie, I apologize. Maggie, you have to unmute yourself. Or maybe I have to. There, what is wrong? There you go. There you go, Maggie, go ahead. Oh, thanks, that's okay. Um, well, I was just thinking about what uh, Mary Lou was saying about this boss who kind of shared the wealth of the company and was still profitable. And it reminded me of this article that I was just reading by Gary that I didn't finish, where he talks about the difference between, um, was it underconsumption and overproduction? And just that, I think that that's the kind of thing that that addresses, that um, people are getting more money or getting into deeper debt, he was saying in this article. And it's, um, uh, it, it addresses the issue of, you know, it's not just that people can't buy stuff, it's that the whole anarchy of production, even when they make more money, it doesn't solve the crisis of overproduction because people are still, they're still producing like huge amounts of things that like, I think the oil crisis right now kind of exposes that with the plunge from $60 a barrel to $20 a barrel. I don't know if that makes sense, but just when Mary Lou Ray said it sounded to me like that was, that that wouldn't solve the problem necessarily that people could buy more. Just that um, with, when you've got a productive system that's totally out of control and not at all in sync with people's needs, but instead only in sync with the drive for uh, uh, super profits. Ari, you want to go ahead? Yeah, could I get on stack, Sharon? Sure. This is Mary Lou. Go ahead, Mary Lou, and then we're going to call it. Call on Gary. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a, a quick point. Uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, essential workers, I think it's so ironic that some of the essential workers are the farm uh, workers that are picking food out and picking crops out in the field. And uh, I didn't mean to imply by talking about the guy who did. Uh, cut his salary and that that was a solution. It's just uh, sort of an example of how even when there are better ways to do things, capitalism is, is stuck on its greed for more and more uh, expanding profits. But uh, yeah, I think uh, and the last thing is that China uh, there was an article recently saying that China is has to constantly be on its guard to fight against the ten, tendency towards capitalism, even though um, China and Russia were both so underdeveloped that they had to kickstart their economies, but that now the Chinese have to stay on guard to preserve their socialism. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other questions before we go on to any of the summations? I don't want to cut anybody off. I said, Bill, you have your hand up. Do you want to um, unmute? I unmuted you. No. Bill, go ahead. Um, just a very quick point. I mean, we live in one world economy. It's dominated by capitalism. So every socialist country mm -hmm. is functioning within that economy. It's like a, uh, right. it's like a, a union, having a union contract in a plant. Or even if you took over, even the workers took over the plant, seized a plant or seized a neighborhood, they would still have to function in a, in a uh, world capitalist economy. So that there's no such thing as, as finished socialism in one country. It's every, it's uh, everything we see in every socialist country, whether it's the path China has taken, Cuba, the DPRK, the USSR is, in the context of having to, uh, is distorted, by having to function inside a world capitalist economy. Uh, which will not end until we you know, overthrow the way of a world revolution. Okay. Um, Gary, are you ready? Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I'll say on the healthcare workers and teachers and so on. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, 
uh, for one thing, they're all, they're all exploited. And um, the, you know, uh, what, you know, the question of being productive labor, the, um, you know, Marx has another uh, category. He talks about teachers um, in capital um, and, you know, saying, you know, in, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a teacher, you're hired, you know, by a school, um, you know, it's a market relationship. You got a wage and, uh, you know, you're, you're producing, um, you know, you're producing surplus value. There's, uh, there's a wage relationship like that. The, there's also um, what he calls commercial workers. And, um, you know, uh, which, you know, uh, partly it covers, uh, you know, people working in the offices who are, um, uh, I mean, specifically the, the people who handle the billing and, uh, you know, the collection of payments and so on is part of what he calls that. But it, they, um, and he's in, uh, in somewhere in Capital, he talks about commercial workers as, you know, they, uh, they're, uh, they don't, he says something like, you know, they don't have a, don't directly produce surplus value, but they have an indirect connection to it. And, um, you know, and they're exploited. They are exploited uh, workers. Um but you know they're not directly producing surplus value, but they're they're necessary part of the uh, you know the, the economy, and uh, I don't know it gets a you know uh, sometimes people I think get too much into trying to come up with you know an exact thing it sometimes it's uh you know it's even uh uh it it's uh it even can be a divisive mm -hmm. thing to try to you know you this person is or that person isn't um and you know the fact is is that you know, you know, 90, the, it's the 90%, you know, there, there are workers and uh, they're part of the working class and they're, they're exploited. Uh, so, you know, uh, that is the relationship in, you know, the, um, the people who are, uh, uh, you know, who they, who seemingly, you know, say they're self-employed or so on. In most cases, they're really, they're working for the bank and they're not, they're not capitalists. They don't have capital. They are working. Um, so anyway, the conclusion. Um, 
the um, you know the I I think that the uh, the important thing for us is to understand um, capitalism that it's in, that would um, that you know that the things that are happening and um, you know the the uh, the the, uh, the crises that are that we see and so on we um, we want to uh, you know we want to change it and um, the the immediate responses to reform what whatever is going on and to uh, you know alleviate the pain to and that that is what what we have to do you know and that is uh, you know and that's why you know why you organize a strike and and it's to to win relief and it's to, but um but what we need to know and we need to understand is that the the reforms won't end uh, won't end the problem they won't the uh, the crises uh, will just come back, um, and so the you know the only yeah and um, you know knowing that it's capitalism is uh, uh, that's you know that's the key to understanding how to really uh, get you know what what we all need and what we all want um, and uh, but I think that that's, um, that's, you know, and that's what's, uh, it's what's not told, it's what's not, uh, you know, when you hear all the things being said, uh, um, you know, people talking about, you know, anyway, that's, that's, that's my conclusion. Thank you, Gary. And, um, I, you know, thank you everybody who hung on to this class on a Sunday. You could have been doing something else, but, you know, nowadays we're all either stay at home or quarantined. So um, we're going to continue on the 26th, I believe, is the next Sunday where we'll be talking about Lenin, the thinker and fighter, which basically flows from this because we're talking about, we talked about imperialism today. There's also the potential for imperialist war and what better person to talk about than Lenin when we'll also be celebrating his birthday, which is April the 22nd, which is also Earth Day. So um, again, hopefully everybody will tune in on the next not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday after that for the next series of classes. And like I said, it'll be on Lenin. 
Um, so it should be exciting class. And by the way, we'll be doing these classes in different formats. Some will be more like a forum where it'll be a webinar where you can only ask questions in the chat. And then other times we'll go back to this more interactive format where people will be able to talk back and forth and have discussion as best as we can. So for many of us who are used to in person, sit around the circle, really be able to interact. It's very hard, but it's certainly we're learning and I want to thank people before we end tonight's meeting. And um, please get back to us. I will put in the chat our email address, which was strugglelalucha at gmail.com. And I would have typed that in there. So if anyone, uh, I'll spell it wrong. So if anybody wants to get in touch, strugglelalucha at gmail.com. Everybody's saying thank you, Gary. And with that, we will end tonight's meeting. Thanks. Thank you.